We know you want it, so here's Better Buddies. Hello, and welcome back to Better Buddies. I'm your host, RJ. With us this week, we've got Calvin. Hello. And James. Hello. Our Better Buddies icebreaker this week. What's your ultimate dream that you know you'll never achieve? Like, the crazy out there kind from when you were a kid, not the semi-realistic, but you just don't want to put the effort in as an adult. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I Yeah, but I yeah. feel like my, my dream, I could actually achieve both like, or like i have two that come to mind and that i've had for a long time and i still feel like they fall in that category of i probably could achieve i'm just definitely too lazy so you're gonna fly the millennium falcon no <laughs> uh, but close uh the one i would say is that i definitely want to go into space oh i would love to go to another planet to like the, the furthest that would go but like just getting into space, I would settle for. Okay. Which I feel like I could theoretically do with a, a like, if I tried. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to share the other one? Oh, the other one's just, um, this one's m more recent, but I'd say I've had this for a little while, is um, in, in the less of, like, a life goal and dream of, like, physical thing that i like want is that for like a um one of the dream uh, the ideas of like a dream home that i've always wanted is a like penthouse apartment in the middle of like a major city and i'm talking like one of the giant skyscrapers penthouse where you get like the whole two top floors and the thing costs like 80 million dollars yeah that's pretty cool oh yeah cool. that i that. think would be awesome what about you, you wake up and you're like in the clouds. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. That would be that'd be dope. Do you have a city you'd want to do that in? Uh, well, Tokyo, obviously. But honestly, I'd take like I think New York would on like New York is pretty grungy. You know, I think in uh many ways overblown. Um, because yeah. it's just always portrayed in most media and all this stuff. But at the same time, I feel like part of that is probably deserved. I've never been. I, I would have to go before I made my final judgment. But, uh, I think, yeah, I don't know. I think Beijing could be like, kind of interesting, but then there's communists. So. As, cool as, it, like, as cool as Tokyo would be, because it is Tokyo. Tokyo is cool. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. But there's something about having the New York penthouse where it's yeah. like, you are in the city where the world is centered, you no. know? Yeah. yeah. Even if it's just for this current time frame. This is the center, yeah. and you're there, and you're on top of it. Yeah, and I and I like the idea of the penthouse. Like, I I would want something that I could feel like cyberpunk esque. So it would have to be some sort of large city that has like a ton of skyscrapers. It can't be just like, oh, it's like a big city, but it's like, well, yeah, it's big in population and area, but there's not like a ton of skyscrapers. No, it needs to be a ton of skyscrapers. And honestly, Tokyo doesn't have that many tall skyscrapers. Uh, but it makes up for it, and it's much the size of the megapolis that it is. And would, there are still some, but yeah, Seoul, Seoul would be kind of cool too. Would you stand at the win the full body window of your penthouse in a nice three piece suit, and glass of scotch in hand? Uh, mm -hmm. yes. Just stare it down at the ants below you. Yeah, but it's got to have a giant terrace, like wraparound terrace. Oh, yeah. That's like bigger than most people's apartments in the city. Hell yeah. I like this. What about you, James? What are you dreaming? Dream big, kid. As a as a kid, um, I really, and this is like middle school esque, but like I really wanted to write for Bungie. Um, like I really wanted to write for that video game company because like. Growing up in middle school, like playing Halo and not even just playing the video game, but like being involved in like or being proximal to like the machinima community and kind of seeing like what could really happen when like people 
felt comfortable to like play around in a world that a company like that kind of like founded and set up and took care of and even encouraged in a lot of ways. I thought like as a kid, it would just be so cool to be able to like sit in a video game studio and come up with like different stories for Halo and also to be able to watch like the people uh, who liked the stories that myself and other people had written, like make their own and help like encourage those as well. Um, so, but I know that like, I'm never, I'm never going to be able like, I'm never going to do that. Like, I, the, the, you know, I, I don't guess, even know if I'd want to. Yeah. My question point. was going to be like, considering where Bungie's at right now, would you want to even do that? I like probably not mainly because like they, um, they're not, are they still technically under like Microsoft? No, no. they, they left yeah. Microsoft after reach. The deal to get out of Microsoft was two more Halo games and they let and they gave ODST and Reach. And okay. then they entered into a partnership with Activision. Yeah. And Activision, I didn't like own them, but had I think they had a lot of control over yeah. um Destiny because they were like the publishers. So yeah. that's why um Destiny One was a little rushed and lacked story. <laughs> Because they were kind of forced down some paths and stuff, supposedly. Um, supposedly, there were also some rewrites that happened pretty late stage. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. and I, then I, and then they separated from Activision. So I want to say they're completely on their own now. I I remember with that Activision stuff. I heard the version I heard, like because I followed some of the writers on Twitter and their socials, and I was like reading posts and stuff like that and it literally sounded like they were planning to ship De the original destiny as like a full story game with like 70 hours or something like a, a big campaign way bigger than what it what it ended up being but active publisher basically stepped in and was like well that's not how you like make money like we gotta basically they they had them gut the entire main game and that's where like all the different dlc uh, and it, like story expansions came from was Activision basically kind of making Bungie like dice up the original story into like sections that, that they would then like resell and release at later dates. Okay. Um, which is really unfortunate because I feel like if that game had not been so like mismanaged, like I do feel like it could have been not like an equivalent to halo like when it first came out but it really could have done something like special i think it had that potential and the fact that they just kind of like fucked it up because like a bunch of business guys were like that's not how you make money you stupid idiots <laughs> um it's really disappointing um but i i would say like now no i probably wouldn't want to work for bungie and i've just realized like i feel like working on a team of writers would be fun but it'd also be like really stressful and really dramatic um but yeah it sounds way harder than just writing on your own yeah like at least writing on your own you do like because i am kind of a control freak when it comes to that stuff and i'm not trying to like like pathologize anything but i do like to have like a, a good deal of input on like the stories i'm telling um and i feel like it would be difficult to write in a team it is something that like there's a part of me the kid part that will always like want to have done it um and and who's sad that it will never kind of like manifest but that's uh that's just part of growing up see and i love the idea of team writing like because i know with with what i've been experiencing as i've been writing this year has been i'm i'm not gonna say i'm great at anything because i'm not like trained up in any way but like my my weaknesses are in like dialogue and uh basic story development but like mm -hmm. when i was in some of the feedback i've gotten and like worked with another writer on giving getting feedback i felt good in that process of like building and constructing and culmination because but maybe that's just because i'm a novice and it's like oh, i'm helping yep. no i mean in some way like even doing the type of writing i do like writing like a book or writing scripts and stuff like it is even if it's just on your own like it is still a collaborative because you have to, you have to be able to take feedback and take it well um like you can't submit yourself entirely to the feedback and say like well whatever someone gave me for feedback is absolutely what needs to happen but at the same time like you absolutely cannot be the type of person who's like 
well, this person just didn't get it. Like, fuck them. I'm not going to change anything. Like, yeah. it has, you have to be able to, like, that is a really important part. And that's part of the fun, too, is, like, like seeing and hearing how other people, like, read what you've written. Um, and it does help you grow quite a bit. What about cool. you, RJ? What's um, your what graveyard of dreams? <laughs> well, now mine feel kind of silly, but uh, I wanted to be a Pokemon master while flying through the Millennium Falcon with my friends. That's not fucking silly. It's That's kind like of silly. What, what kid who grew up, like, what little boy who grew up, like, we did wouldn't want to do that. Apparently you guys. Well, I mean, like, but you're, this is probably, for you, this is probably what, more of like a, like, that sounds like elementary school. Like Yeah, when I did say, like, the crazy kind from when you were a kid. I know, I know. That was the first thing that I could think of that was, like, substantive. That's fair. Do I definitely a... wasn't a seven or eight-year-old who'd look under bushes hoping to find a Pokemon. Oh, dude, I used to pretend when I was walking around my subdivision that it was, like, you know, like the starting, um... <laughs> the starting town from from pokemon like i would hope that's why like when yeah. pokemon go came out for the first like month that it was out it really was like i feel like a really cool experience because for the first time since i was a kid like it really did feel like oh my god like the yeah. world of pokemon like it's like, here was, like it's kind of real when i was a little kid i genuinely was just hoping against hope that the entire planet and all of reality was wrong yeah i know <laughs> yeah right <laughs> You're just like, please let one like really cool thing be true, and then well, you're like, oh, that, it's one of the, that's one of those hopes that's like still stuck with me because like, I don't know, yeah, a couple years ago there was a really bad storm, knocked a tree branch down, pulled a power line out of a power box on my road, but the sound that came out of it was like a wow kind of thing, like didn't sound yeah. like anything I'd ever heard before, sounded totally sci-fi. The power went out, and I sat up, and my brain went. Aw, oh, damn, it's finally happening. <laughs> I'm gonna have my sci-fi adventure. Damn. I no, I mean, I th that's, uh... That's, that's, I think, a recurring, a recurring hope. Like, sometimes you hope that you wake up and you just, like... I don't know. That was the appeal, too, I feel like, of Pokemon, like, getting into, like, both the games and the show was, like, it seemed so idyllic like the world was like challenging and there were threats that people faced but there was always this sense of like general camaraderie and stuff like that like in pokemon like no matter what like you had a feeling stuff was gonna be okay and for there the was, most like, part the that human was... race was kind of all on the same side yeah and also like the concept of like officer jenny and nurse joy is just hilarious and i wish that was <laughs> i wish it was real <laughs> Uh, just all police officers are sisters who are related to each other, and same thing with all nurses. That would be funny. That would be funny. Their family reunions must be hell, though. Oh my god, there must be millions of them. How do they even keep track? How, it's uh, gotta how do be they by, go... like, city or, like, state. It's like, alright, everybody in this region goes to this reunion, everybody in that region goes to that reunion, and we wrote, like, there's one region that gets to, like, go, like, they rotate around. But how did they distinguish, like, at the family reunion? Like, do they all have name tags where it's like, I'm Officer Jenny G, I'm Officer Jenny H? Like, do they have last names? How, how do they actually, like, do well, they all wear the same clothes? Like, Jenny must be their last clothes? name. Oh. Officer Jenny, like Officer McCoy, or Officer Diaz, or Officer Notepad, like, Nick Notepad. So it'd be like Officer Julia Jenny, or Officer Hilda Jenny. Yeah, that's and a good point. And they'd be like identical I, I, twins where they like, nobody else get, can tell them apart, but because they lived with each other, they know. They, they, they're aware. Who, yeah. who, who, who do you crush more on, Officer Jenny or Nurse Joy? Ooh. That's a toughie. I have nothing to contribute to this conversation. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Well, no, you're Calvin, good. <laughs> do you want a nurse or a policewoman? Uh... Moving on. <laughs> I just, mine's officer jenny all the way oh my god handcuffs aren't they i uh, no. it's no it's just uh yeah you know she's she seems like uh, a strong woman you know that's james uh, likes that's to my, be thrown around by a strong woman i'd like to be arrested by an attractive young woman yeah like i'm deleting <laughs> this now never mind this <laughs> episode's canceled <laughs> nope you asked <laughs> uh you know what yeah that's on me that's uh, on me.
Fuck. <laughs> God damn it, James. <laughs> they love me. I'm sorry. I'm back. I'm back, uh, everybody. <laughs> yeah, you're back, all right. Our next segment, Whoa. Better Buddies Recommend, where we recommend a piece of media to enjoy. Uh, James, please don't recommend anything. <laughs> I I actually have one right off the bat. Oh, please I recommend do. something. Okay. I uh, have fallen down a rabbit hole in the past couple Uh-oh. of weeks. I've been watching Did you get out? shit. Is that where you've been? Um, <laughs> have you finally escaped Wonderland? In a way, yeah. In, in multiple ways, yes. In many ways, no. I've just fallen down in deeper into Wonderland. You got to see how deep <laughs> it goes in the word Orpheus. Um, but oh, no. I uh, that wasn't sexual, Calvin. He's talking about the Matrix, all right. But <laughs> well, anyway, whenever you say now. that, though, I just think of the sorry. I just think of the robot chicken bed, and he's just, oh. like, <laughs> he's just like, "Hello, rabbit hole." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay, totally forgot about that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, no, I would, for me, uh, I've been watching, I never watched them a whole lot um, up until like recently, and I don't know why, but I've been watching a lot of Funhouse. Okay. Um, oh, yeah? Older Funhouse. Old, like, okay, I was about to ask. Yeah, like I'll watch occasional new Funhouse, but I, I'm going to be the basic like internet commenter and say that clearly, like I I think they are in a bit of a transition period. Like they lost a lot of their key kind of like personalities and people in the past like a year and a half. So they like, lost like everyone except for James and Elise. It, yeah, of yeah. the of the original Funhouse of, people, those two the, are the only ones that are left. Really? Yeah, yeah, huh. yeah. and I mean like. They're good. They're a good pair. Like, if you wanted any pair to kind of, like... Oh, yeah, for sure. Pair, it would be them, because they're just, like, great together. But, it like, watching their older... I love... I love their gameplays, where they're not even really gameplays. They're sitting down in, like, costumes, and they're basically, <laughs> like, improv Like, yeah. during the whole gameplay, they've got, like, some for their band manager game, or there's, like surfers versus skaters mm-hmm. or shit like that and i just like you know because i was way more into like achievement hunter and rooster teeth and people like that when i was like when funhouse was producing similar content when i would mm-hmm. would have been in the age range where it was targeted to but i really just found myself like gravitating towards them I, I think they're like a really fun group of people to watch just interact and like they are kind of the like it's always sunny version of like rooster teeth i would argue they're very like they can be very like off color and um like a little bit cruder which is like acts as a turnoff for some people and i can totally Mm -hmm. understand why um but i think they're just like who they are and how they work together i've really been loving their um i mean obviously i love all their more like degenerate stuff like the gameplays where they get high or they'll like get (laughs) fucked blitzed while they play like mario party like that to me that's really enjoyable to see um and i'm glad that those videos exist but yeah i would i would recommend funhouse i'd recommend if anyone's listening to this i would recommend checking out their band manager gameplay um or one of their like drunk streams um i think those are really fun to watch did you ever watch some of their old excuse me um their older uh demo disc game uh, uh, series I'm working my way back almost. So I've gotten to okay. some of the demo discs, but I haven't seen like too many of them. I, that's, that's what I used to also actually be really into Funhouse back when they like first came out, when they first started. Yeah. I watched like a ton of their gameplay videos and a ton of their uh, demo disc. I used to watch uh, a lot of their demo disc back in the, I think it, um, that one suffered as it went on because in the beginning it was a really fun interesting topic or like uh like idea for a video that for those who don't know basically they had this big giant binder that i can't remember if one of them saved or was given to them um but back in the early 2000s late 90s um when games were trying to market themselves they would stick they would stick part of their game on a disc that was sent out with like gaming magazines and you could try a portion of the game and to, that would entice you to buy it. So they had this giant binder full of all of these games, most of which 
some didn't ever get actually made, I think. And then others were just like lost to time and made by like indie developers or smaller stuff. And so they just went through all of these half the fun of it was that since it was made for like a Windows 98, they would run into issues of the game just being horribly broken and unplayable. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then as time went on, they ran out of those. So they kind of had to pivot to uh, playing like indie, like no name Steam games, if yeah. I remember correctly, which kind of works. But I felt like the format was a lot better in its original form. No, part of the charm of that idea is the fact that they are like these relics almost. And it's yeah. like people kind of like interact with technology that's like so outdated and to try to like navigate it. I would agree. Who's cool. your favorite? Uh, you have a favorite uh, member? Uh, I always liked James back when I watched it. <clears throat> Bruce was pretty good. I love Bruce. I think Bruce might be my favorite. I, I think I think he's just he's so fun to watch because he's like he really is like it's a joke in the community, but it really is like true even just from a like a more removed outside perspective. Like he really is kind of like the like the old man or like the dad of like the group where he like so often and so clearly has like no idea <laughs> what's going on or what he's doing, and it's just fun to see him like be supportive and and get like at times wildly frustrated with like not <laughs> going on yeah. the sentiment that I identify with uh, quite a bit, but yeah, I, I would recommend Funhouse for sure. Cool. I was never hugely into Funhouse, but I appreciated them when they guessed it on other things. Yeah. They're fun to see interact with different groups of people for sure. Um, there's Matt a great, at least was uh, maybe it was just because of how oh. often she guessed, or like because she was just guesting, but she always came in like as a prime guest. There's a I can't remember exactly how it goes, but there's a great um, the the one like Rooster Teeth show that John Reisinger has their had where it was on like the a spot. Spot on the spot. That was it. Yeah, yeah. And like uh, there was one where like the Fun House were guest starring, and like some of them were in the audience, at least included, and like. I can't, it's a, it's a kind of a famous clip, like, in the, in that circle, but it's, like, um, Lawrence from Funhouse, like, he got asked a question, and he said something like, women shouldn't be in video games, and it's quiet, and then out of the audience, you hear somebody go, like, woo, and clapping at the least, and it's, like, that's funny, that's great, that's really, just that clip, it's, like, that sums up almost their whole kind of, like, group, and it's, like, that's really funny to see. Uh, thank you, James, for giving me what I'm going to recommend this week, because I was struggling a little bit. Yes. Um, I want to second Calvin's recommendation from last week. I tried it out. It was very enjoyable. The YouTube channel listening oh, in. Oh, those YouTube videos. Yeah. Uh, I watched the John Williams music of Star Wars and the uh, Lord of the Rings, how Howard Shore's impeccable score makes us feel. That one is... Like, did you get emotional just watching I did, that video? And I haven't seen right? the movies. Right? It's so good. <laughs> I loved how he pointed out that, like, oh yeah, here's the Shire like melody, and how originally okay. it's the the just the pipe, and mm -hmm, it's so simple, mm -hmm. and and then it breaks and it's so disjointed and it's like it and it happens in a way that back. you just never that you never notice. Like I noticed the Shire theme throughout it, but I definitely didn't like pay attention and be like, Oh, it's broken now, but I definitely felt the feelings from it. Well, same thing with like, uh, listening to the John Williams one and the mm -hmm. Luke, uh, the Luke and Leo one. <sighs> yeah. And especially like, I kind of liked that he approaches the John Williams one of, we're going to do one song from each trilogy but we're going mm -hmm. in storyline order, not movie release order. Yeah, which you would ex you tend to expect to be like, oh, in John in release order because that's John Williams' progression as a musician. That's just like the timeline in real life. Yeah, but <laughs> by doing it in storyline order, it just somehow really worked better. I think of like, mm -hmm. hey, here's an established John Williams. He knows what he's doing. And here's an example of him knowing what he's doing and playing with the things 
he knows and is skilled in to get you to feel the sense of dread and feel the tension and conflict in Duel of the Fates. Mm -hmm. And then here's the newer John Williams with the original trilogy playing with Luke, like Leia's theme and how it ties into these other songs that are important in the trilogy, but still be still is distinctly Leia. And then for the sequel trilogy on the dust planet, a nearly 15 minute long musical song, like, sequence one song for that battle and how it ties in all these other themes from across the movie franchise but is still cohesive uh but my recommendation for this week to follow that seconding is on the spot by rooster team yeah. uh, i just why? really remember watching it i and it might be i enjoyed it because i enjoyed the people in it but i think it's strong mm. enough to stand on its own because a lot of the times they use personalities I didn't know from, like, Achievement. Like, I watched mostly Achievement Hunter, so I didn't know Barbara that well. I didn't know, um, uh, oh, what's his name? He had right. a paraplegic, um... Zach Anner. Oh, Zach he's Anner. amazing. Zach he's Anner, so oh, good. Zach Anner he's is so hilarious. Fun. The dude is <laughs> hilarious. Yeah, no, him on that show is some of my favorite bits. Um, sorry, just sorry no, yeah. to interrupt you. But my favorite, my one of my favorite bits from that is that Blaine's on there and Zach and Blaine um, gets called out by like uh, some. Well, I forget his name. Uh, one of the guys, um, and he and because he said um, instead of uh, they were talking about uh, Ju Judaism, and uh, one of the guys like I think Blaine said Juicyism instead of Judaism. And then Zach Anner immediately pops in and is just like, listen, there's a fine line between Hasidic Jews and Hasidic juice. <laughs> <laughs> and that just cracks me up every time. Is well, because he's so good at delivery. Like he's oh, yeah. really good. I, like Zach is just great at like knowing the right time to make a joke and like how to make it. And which is like a really undervalued comedic skill. Which is great, I think, in combination with, like, he's got... Is it ALS? Not, it's not ALS. It's... Um, I know what it is. He's paraplegic. Yeah, I, point is. Yeah, I can't mm -hmm. remember. Um, is it, It's but, not cerebral palsy. Is no, it? it is. It is. Okay. I think I'm, like, 90% sure he's got cerebral palsy. So he really doesn't have great use of it. He can't use his legs. Only really has use of one arm. But yep, I looked it up. Cerebral palsy. He knows it. Like, yeah, he know. Duh, he knows he's. He knows what he, his body. But he also knows the impact he has on other people and plays that like a fiddle. Mm. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. is, and, yeah. And he and he's not afraid to make a joke at his own expense. Especially no, when he knows it's gonna like make other people uncomfortable to a degree rarely, of like. It, a, oh, you're you're. I, like just this sense of like I know what I am I know you know what you, I am and I know you're uncomfortable with it so I'm gonna like make you more uncomfortable just to mess with you I think the nice thing is too most of the time with him it doesn't feel like minstrel-esque it doesn't feel no, like he's yeah. turning himself into like a stereotype for the sake of a joke like it feels mm -hmm. like very like honest you know what I mean he's not like it sounds really bad but he's not like exploiting himself by doing it you know no. it's, it, it's it, mm -hmm. like it's a very, like, authentic gesture of, like, comedy. And the vast know? majority of his humor is just plain humor, like... Yeah. Plain humor, yeah. But, like, oh, yeah. It's not like he's just using his disability as a joke or, like, putting himself down all the time. It's just occasionally when he does go to that well, it's always a good chart, like, a good pick. Like, he yeah, knows exactly how, what to do and how to play it to get the maximum impact. It's great with him because, like, it sounds... I don't know if this is going to sound really bad, but sometimes it's like you forget, like, watching him that he's in the chair. And then he'll say a joke where it's like, it's like, oh, right, you you have cerebral palsy. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, he's... and it's like, it's such a great, like, you're right. Like, he's very self-aware and in a really perceptive, good way. And he's not afraid of physical comedy either because there are times where he'd have them get him out of the chair. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Isn't he in, like some of their film stuff? He's in like uh like uh Eleven Little Roosters or yeah. something like that. It, yeah, yeah. He's like the he's supposed to be the man in the chair. 
he's the guy at the desk that's like i want to say isn't he They're not cute yeah, yeah cute. He, or, he's cute yeah yeah, he's, yeah that's he's, what it is that's what it is he's cute and he wants to, like constantly molest like gavin or something like that which is like <laughs> fucking great <laughs> like it's so good um, i love that but and then <laughs> on the spot like another really great episode is there was it's not as great now now that you, the years later but uh jeff was on i think in an attempt to do like he jeff and griffin were on and they were in a relationship at the time and oh, shit, jeff yeah. tried to like do nice things for her as like a <laughs> anniversary slash sorry we're on this right now yeah. And at one point, all of Achievement Hunter, like, comes in with weapons and knives and, like, set a bench down and they just plop down in front of the, t- like, cameras. Just invade the set for a bit. That's fucking funny. I don't think I've seen that one. That one oh, sounds awesome. You've gotta watch Because they come in, they come in and, like, invade the set for a bit and then, like, leave a halberd for Griffin. <laughs> Dude, I miss the old RT shorts. I really do. Those are fucking funny. Like the first couple seasons of them, because Griffin's in a few of them. Um, yeah, and she's, like funny in them. I miss that like old, like twenty ten ish era. Well, before we get back to that era, uh, we're not letting Calvin off the hook that easy. I know we got to get a we got to re- get a wreck. Oh, nice try. I know. <laughs> uh... I honestly had one when I sat down tonight and I was like, all right, I got one. Um, totally forgot. No idea what it was. Damn. Yikes. Maybe you'll, maybe, maybe you'll think of it if you just spit something random out. Go on, spit. I want to hear yeah. you spit. Spit. No. <laughs> just hawk a big old loogie right on your floor. Spit, spit a few bars. Oh, I got one. This isn't it at all. This I know for a fact this isn't what I sat down thinking, but I'll recommend this. I Do don't it. think I recommended this before, but the uh, Amazon Prime show Carnival Row. Oh? Wait. Oh, shit. James, one- you and I watched like the first two episodes, is, um, and then, is and then I the finished the series where, uh, with uh, Orlando Bloom Park and Cara yeah. Delevingne. Car- uh, yeah. Calvin. Oh, I got some bad news. Definitely recommended it before. Yeah. Yeah. Figured. Uh, to be fair, well, it's the first time I've I still recommend you it. So something if you haven't again. seen it, James, <laughs> go and watch it. I know. I gotta. I I do have uh, Amazon Prime again. Um. So I'm good. What else? What else? What else? I got. Um. I I... Even just an interesting video you saw, like over the course of the week. Well, man. Yeah. Yeah, I got nothing. No. The interesting videos are what I recommended last week. Uh, Damn. No. Go now. No. It's nothing's Movie. coming to mind. TV show. I haven't, haven't watched anything. Music. Recommend a Western. Or recommend think, an Eastern. One you think people should see. Or an Eastern. A Western that I think people should see. Any Western. Yeah. Um, Magnificent Seven. Rio Bravo. Ooh, what's Rio Bravo? Oh, pro- that's such a good one to say. I that's think I've recommended it. Well, you have probably you have. It's it's uh it's my favorite. It's one of my favorite John Wayne's. It's more comedic and lighthearted. Um, it's serious. It's got James Dean in it. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. No, you're, oh. Are, are you or are you thinking it doesn't have Dean Martin in it? Is that that's what I said. Dean Martin. Oh, yeah, okay. it. same I'm person out. as James Dean. No, I don't know why I said James Dean. Yeah, James uh, Dean only did three movies. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea why I said James Dean. But Dean Martin. I got the Dean part. You I did. think that's where yeah. I went wrong. Um, yeah, no. So Dean Martin uh, is in it, and he's fantastic. And so, and so is John Wayne. I mean, John Wayne is very John Wayne. So, mm. But yeah, it's a lot more lighthearted and comedic. It's funny. Um still a western it's still got those elements got some good gunfights yeah the premise is basically like what would it be like if like because isn't dean martin like the new guy in town kind of like he shows no. up no uh, i, I don't plot, yeah, i don't remember if we watched this i think we did i think we did watch it okay uh no dean martin was a deputy with john wayne's character who's the sheriff 
I just and remember- then he goes after he goes after a girl, and the oh. girl like leaves him and breaks his heart, and he climbs into a bottle and then becomes a drunk. And <laughs> it starts out with him kind of uh, helping out John Wayne's character and saving him. And he gets it, and then he kind of helps him out through the film, becomes a deputy again, cleans up his act. Here's alcoholism in a week. Wow. <laughs> See, I feel like anybody who goes to watch a Western, you, you made a comment about, like, hey, it's a Western, keep, like, somebody made that comment. Like, if you're going to watch a Western, you kind of know what you're getting into, right? Like, yeah. It's kind well, of it's, part of the genre. It's weird because the genre definitely has very identifiable and like consistent forms and patterns, but each Western is like slightly different in a way where like you really do have to watch. There's there's a genre of Westerns that are very almost exactly the same thing, but there are also plenty of Westerns like like not every Western has something like a, like what happens in Rio Bravo where Dean Martin has basically not like a musical number, but his own like song that he sings. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's like. That's what's interesting about the Western is it's a very, like, broad form that allows for a lot of different kind of, like, stories to be told. Oh, I thought you meant, like, hey, there's going to be negative stereotypes because that's what existed when the Westerns were made. There there Which, like, are, but... Western stories honestly, don't have to have them just no. because of the history of the genre itself and how many mo of those movies are older. You just kind of got to be like, those are going to be there. Yeah, it, it is interesting, though, because they're not honest. I don't think, and granted, I'm not a woman or, like, an ethnic minority, so I can't exactly speak on this, like, topic from a point of subjectivity. But I would say that from the Westerns I've seen, actually, m quite a few of them are, are not as, like, insensitive as you would think. You know what I mean? Because, like... Cool. In the Western, like, there's definitely a theme that hopefully was maybe in some way also prevalent in the West, where it's like, I don't know, we're all fucking scraping out here for, like, survival. There's no time or energy to be, like, really racist or sexist. Like, all that really matters is kind of the, the yeah. context of your character. I mean, there's definite, like... To an extent. I I, I mean, yeah. I, see what you're, I, I know what you're saying, yeah. but, yeah. But also... There's definitely caricatures. Yeah, there's, there's yeah. plenty of them. Like, for sure. But... Um, I mean, I, I like, like a uh, perfect example of a caricature would be like Stumpy from Rio Bravo, where he's just the toothless, like old prospector man who's like uh, perfect. He's got a great voice. All right. Well, uh, our next segment, pending any possible, uh, what's the word I want? Current events news. Like yeah, that's it. the other thing. I had like a couple things that I wanted to bring up as well. I can't remember them anymore. I have one that I, I would I'll at least float out there. I just today, I know this is probably old old news, old hat. I just today watched the uh, Spider Man. Um, is it no no way, no way home? home. That I mean, if yesterday, it, I was going to say it's old in the fact that it dropped yesterday. Oh shit! Okay, <laughs> yeah, I, my I, dude. I, um, have you guys like seen that? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. So my, my question with it is this, it's two pronged. One, what do you think about it from the taste that you got? And two, what do you think about the current state of Marvel and their trajectory? Like, what do you see materializing? Uh, I'll go first. Cause I feel Please like it's going to take longer. Uh, yeah. I, I was surprised by the trailer. I don't know what I was expecting, but it definitely started taking it in a turn that I wasn't picturing one i didn't i don't think i knew dr strange was going to be in this film um i guess spoilers for the trailer i know some people don't like watching trailers because they spoil films so yeah. if you're trying to avoid the trailer we're going to be talking about the trailer uh but yeah, yeah i didn't know dr strange was going to be in the film uh so i think it's an interesting premise i don't know i feel like i could also get annoyed by it because that i the whole like alternate reality like stuff i personally like it, it's a fine line for me between what i find enjoyable and what i find like yeah i just want something that has meaning and i find that a lot of times when you go alternate world alternate reality it pulls meaning because it's like oh well it's it's not real it's not their it's not their world so yeah i mean yeah there are, there are consequences and it can be done in a way that i can have 
very impactful, meaningful con- uh, consequences. But I don't know. Just me personally, I can have a hard time with it. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's going to be interesting, and I'll probably go see it. But for Marvel as a whole, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm i honestly more excited for the next season of Loki, probably, than I am anything else. Yeah. I, the movies I will probably continue to watch, but it's the whole, like, got to see everything day one, got to, like, I'm I'm all in on this, very much for me personally ended with Endgame. So... Uh, speaking to your point about alternate realities, Calvin, I actually do agree. Um, and I think two dis- two good Marvel examples of this is What If is fun as a series, but because of the nature of What If, it loses a lot of the meaning because it's literally like, hey, here's one reality, and now next episode we're yeah. gonna talk about something else. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Also, real quick, I, I just want to. I just yeah. realized I I just said I was excited about Loki, following the point where I said I don't like alternate timeline stuff, which is exactly all Loki is. So I think Loki handled it decently well. We'll see how the second season treats it because it's going to be even more chaos. But I'd say Loki is my idea of something I liked. It played with timelines, but still very much held to like one. Yeah. Yeah. Um. A good example of playing with alternate reality for Marvel, I would say, is Into the Spider-Verse, where while Miles was the main focus, we did get the Peter B. Parker from the alternate reality who came in, had his concerns about, like, having a kid with MJ, and then his, like, end scene in the movie is him trying to clean up his act and coming to the, like, having grown as Mm -hmm. a character from his time in the other, so, like, they did impact each other. Yeah. Um, as for the trailer, holy shit. Um... There, I So, based on what I've been reading and what I saw, I think there's a lot of play being done with scene cuts. Um, such as Peter's in handcuffs and in the police precinct, and then it cuts to a scene of all the files on the table and an arm slapping down some more. But they don't show you who's attached to the arm. Could be Matt Murdock! Um, mm-hmm. later oh. when... <laughs> yeah. Um... Later, there's the scene with the dust and the Doc Ock tentacle comes up and, like, yep. clamps down. And it cuts to Peter looking at something and it, another one, like, clamps down and Ock appears and says, Hello, Peter. But they cut, they don't show both of them in the same scene, which makes people think it might not be Holland's Peter. Peter? Oh. Um, Interesting. Then they had, like, a Green Goblin pumpkin bomb from the first trilogy they had Willem Dafoe's laugh there was the electrical bolts which made people go oh electro uh if you pause at one of the electrical bolt scenes you can clearly see a spider-man being protected by a very humanoid wall of dust which makes people think sandman Batman. from yeah. uh, spider-man uh-huh. 3 is both going to be in it and have retained his characterization from that movie of i'm uh I'm, gen- I'm not really a terrible person. I just made a bad decision trying to protect my daughter. Yeah. Um, and another thing to point out is at the end of Spider-Man 2, Doc Ock had, like, gotten control just enough of the tentacles to, like, destroy his project and sink it into the river. But yes. whenever the tentacles were in control, they glowed red, which they do in the trailer. So Ock is not his redeemed self from the end of 2, or if he is, if it's like the same continuity, it's not that he redeemed himself entirely, it's he got enough control to stop that, and now they're back kind of in control. Yeah, like in that moment, he was able to overcome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There's also some question as to whether the Doctor Strange (laughs) present is the Doctor Strange, because like... What is Doc Strange doing casting this spell all willy-nilly for a teenager with no consideration uh, for the magical effect impact? Yeah. And... I mean, that seems kind of like it would play to a degree for, like... I could see them trying to play Doctor Strange as, like, a guy with all this ability who's now bored because he has no way to, like, utilize it. You know what I mean? And he's just kind of up for anything. Um... I do like that pairing. I like the pairing yeah. of Peter Parker and Doctor Strange. I think that's like a really <laughs> group. Like well, there's, I, also, there's also some implication of an evil Doc Strange if okay. 
uh, just because of like there's the train scene where Doc like makes a bunch it, of trains circle around Peter. It does it look like, like I th I thought he was fighting Peter. That's like, that's what I first thought when I saw yeah. that scene. Or like when the scene where he hits Spider Man and Peter's astral form falls out. It, mm -hmm. Peter's holding something that looks very arcane. Okay. Um. So I'm I'm hyped as hell, but I'm also very aware that I'm biased. Uh, well, I think it's interesting because, like, I watch these trailers totally differently than, like, and this is what I have to constantly remind myself because I can be very cynical and very, like, downcast about these movies. But I don't watch them through the lens of somebody who's, like, imbibed basically this entire, like, cosmology. Religion. Exactly. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, you know, in a way, it's like it truly is like a cosmology. Like, it's a mythology. Like, it truly is, like, has become its own, like, systematized story. Yeah. to tell like about the world and and that's something that i have to like consistently keep in mind is like for a lot of people in varying degrees who are more like into this than me like that's why there's so many different layers and levels of enthusiasm for it so i have like three things to say can i say can i say three things <laughs> you yeah, can I only say, you say two uh, two and a half <laughs> two and a half uh, okay. i'm gonna be try uh, i'm gonna uh one, one, your piece, one, man. one of them is basically a half um three things one i think it's very interesting that this that this major plot line is peter parker focusing on him like having his identity exposed because it mirrors in a way um the end of iron man one and, and kind of iron man's like general plot line throughout the marvel like past uh kind of story where like he had to grapple with to a degree in some areas having his identity exposed um and like kind of uh dealing with that because clearly mm -hmm. throughout the past movies they set up to have a very paternal relationship like between peter parker and like tony stark so i think it's interesting that peter parker is basically picking up his like quote unquote like father's burden and like having to basically develop and extrapolate from that um two I think it's absolutely fascinating that J. Jonah Jameson is basically Alex Jones in this universe. If you look in one of the shots, and I, I, I didn't pause, I just saw it in the background, the Daily Bugle vans, the font for the Daily Bugle is basically the exact same font as InfoWars. Like, it's almost that's the exact funny. same yeah. line. So I think that's really... Well, they set like that up at the end of the last one. They yeah. did. They, like, with him, yeah. Yeah, I, I just funny because I think that's like kind of a fun like pop culture inclusion that I'm like I'm like okay with because I'm like that's funny that adds like a really unique uh, angle to like J. Jonah Jameson's character because he's always kind of been like a Spider-Man conspiracy theorist and now it's just kind of like taken to its modern kind of perspective. Three, I think Marvel. I'm gonna predict. They've had very successful films. They've had some really well-made blockbusters, some really great movies. I'm going to predict in the next decade, they will accidentally make their best movie. Um, <laughs> I think they will. I think they are at the point now where we all know that the Marvel era ended with Endgame. Like, not the era in the sense of they're going to, they're, they're not going to stop making stuff and they shouldn't. Um, they're like, people aren't going to stop being interested in them and they shouldn't, but like, I do think now where the spotlight is kind of off of them and it's like, like Sauron's eye, it's kind of looking for something else. Um, I think like with that pressure relieved with the freedom from the kind of more constrictive structure of that 10 year plan, I think they're going to end up making a superhero movie that is like possibly not only genre defining, but like media like film defining like i think they have that capacity if if all the right elements line up i'm very interested to see where marvel goes i, I want them to get more and more weird and more experimental <laughs> i think that's kind of what they're like i've been saying this for the last two years so i'm a broken record but that's i agree with you that that's where they're going just by looking at shang li and the eternals like mm -hmm. just looking at the oh, shang li the eternals comes out, looks great yeah and like Shang-Chi comes out on the third. It's like a week away. And all of the trailers yeah. seem so much more like kung kung fu action movie to me than superhero. 
And, yeah. like, Eternals is buck wild weird, man. Like, the characters themselves in the comics are just so weird and out of left field. Well, and that's the, that's the fun thing about, like, comics is, like, from the few things that I've, like, seen is they can be so, like, melodramatic in almost, like, a Shakespearean sense. And they can be so out there and so bizarre. And it's, like, I feel like we did get some of that with the past decade of Marvel. But I feel like they only kind of touched, it was, like, the tip of the iceberg. Like, I feel like there's so much more that they can do to kind of make it, like, truly... Um, innovative in, a, yeah. in both a story and dramatic perspective. And I'm very interested to see what they do moving forward. I do not want them to like, as much as I've railed against them and complained, I do not want them to go out with like a whimper. I want them. I, I do feel like they have like one truly great, like artsy fartsy genre film in them that they can like push out. Um, I have faith. I, I'm glad to hear that. Cause I'm just kind of hopeful that it's, like you said, the pressure's off of them now. So they can kind of do what they want and keep doing their thing and expand outwards. And, like, I feel like we're almost seeing the same thing that happened with who's going to get the first team movie out. Um, Mm -hmm. Warner Brothers with Justice League versus... um, The Avenger. The Avengers, which, like... Yeah, Avengers came out, like, years before Justice League did. But then Civil War was coming out same day and date as Batman vs. Superman. And it was like, ooh, who's gonna get the superheroes fighting each other movie win? Civil War did. Civil War totally won that contest. And now we're seeing it again. DC was was playing catch-up in the last two. Can we get a shared universe? Can we get a superheroes fighting each other success? DC played catch-up in both instances and lost for it. And after Justice League and the Zack Snyder cut, they basically said, alright, fuck this. We're we're jumping straight to multiverse. We're just gonna jump straight to multiverse. Don't care about it. DC multiverse, we're gonna get there first. We're gonna have The Flash. We're gonna have uh, Robert Pattinson's Batman. The Flash is gonna deal with the multiverse in his movie and have Michael Keaton back as Batman. And, like, without... Almost, I almost want to say without meaning to, Marvel like looked around and was like, but we did it first again. <laughs> well, like, I would, I mean, I think it's interesting because I do think DC had a kind of like small but present victory, at least in, the, in an artistic sense with Joker, even though Joker was basically a carbon copy and like clearly just aping the tropes and the style of like 70s films. No superhero movie as of yet that I have seen from almost anybody. And I'm even including, like, my go-tos, which are, like, the Dark Knight trilogy. Like, no one has really attempted to do something like that. Yeah. And I think for do that, and it wasn't, like, I am by no means, like, even, I would say, like, a fan of Joker. Um, but I think just the sheer attempt is very interesting. To truly try and put, like, a superhero film into a cinematic context and language is a really difficult thing to pull off. And they almost did it. They almost did it. Um, And I think like that is, I think there's like two concurrent competitions. It's like, who's going to make the best kind of like the best of all time superhero movie. And who's going to make the superhero movie that is like the quote unquote, like artistic triumph. Um, And I think right now both studios have the potential to win either or both of those contests. Uh, I would disagree that both have the potential. I would say DC certainly has potential to compete in the artistic realm, as evidenced by Joker. But yeah, Um, yeah. unless they really pull off a miracle, their best movies have been behind them since like whenever the last Dark Knight movie came out. No, you're right. I mean, like, Marvel already kind of won, like, the quote-unquote, like, best superhero movie contest. But in that case, then, there's still one kind of prize up for grabs. And I think DC is, like, I haven't seen the new Suicide Squad. Um, I have HBO Max. So oh, I watch shit. It. I think I was going to recommend that originally. <laughs> I... I, I Like, I haven't even really seen or heard any reviews of it. I mean, I know that, like, obviously people are better than the first one but it's, it's like so much better they 
they hired James Gunn and said, do whatever you want. Anything. Anything at that all. Chi- that child molester, James Gunn? <laughs> that pervert? God, <laughs> fucking hate Twitter. Fucking hate I, Twitter. I, I hate Twitter too, RJ. It's okay. We can commiserate over that. I fucking hate Twitter. Um, I was watching... No. I was, so they finally released the new season of Flash on Netflix. And I've watched three episodes of it so far. And in the third episode, Elongated Man comes back. And Ralph Dibney. But his actor got fired from the show because of tweets from like 2014. And they he came back in and the story went as like, Oh, he got horribly burned in a building explosion. We need to reconstruct his face. Oh, so it's like a different hat. Okay. Yeah, I because mean, he's, his power is like he's elastic and rubber. So, like, he melted and we're healing him. And now he'll look new. But that's so fucking stupid. Because yeah. if you know what motivated that change, then you're just like, yeah. oh, well. Like, they just, just like wrote, a... they wrote around it because of twenty four tweets from, like, 2014. I was like, what, did he, I... what did he say in the tweets? Do you remember? I, I don't remember. It was, it was, it, from what I remember reading about, it was basically the same line as Gunn's tweets of like, hey, here's some bad jokes that people were telling f- that really belonged back in like 2000, but Twitter was new, so people still told them. Yeah, I mean, I think people forget that James Gunn literally made like a prototype superhero movie where like, uh, what's her face? Um, no, what's his face? Uh, Elliot Page rapes mm. um, Rain Wilson. Um, what is this yeah yeah well okay so originally when he was ellen page there's a there's a movie that james gunn made called super with rain wilson and Uh time who was known as ellen page and it's it's about like rain wilson as a as a basically discount vigilante superhero who's going around trying to solve like the murder of his wife and it's like if we put a vigilante in like a high stakes like crime story up against like real mobsters like what would happen and at the time ellen page um was his like hang on like sidekick like she joins him in the film and there's literally a sequence where because like he's like rain wilson is like spoilers i guess like for super but rain wilson like with his like dead wife like there's a scene where him and ellen page are like alone together and she basically like comes on to him and he's he's played throughout the movie as a very kind of like mawkish like very very quiet like unassuming guy so he doesn't like bite her off but it's almost insinuated that she basically like rapes him <laughs> and like you probably shouldn't like, laugh it, at that point no matter how uncomfortable I'm, you are james I'm, I'm not laughing it's just like it like the scene itself be and this is the genius of james gunn is it's there is an a weird twisted element of comedy in it because it's played very awkwardly it's played very uncomfortably and it's less of a like haha that's so funny and more of like haha this is like really difficult to watch um and people forget that he made that movie and then like 10 years later he was making literally big blockbusters that like millions of people went to see Like like guardians of the galaxy Exactly. Mm. He made a film that basically, like, arguably, if he hadn't made Guardians of the Galaxy, like, I don't know what Marvel would have done. I seriously don't. Like, no. I his infusion yeah. of style, like, seriously added. It was like a fucking uh, a defibrillator. You oh, know what I mean? I like, firmly believe if anyone else had made that movie, it would not have succeeded as well as it did because it made us care about yeah. a tree. Well, mm. even even just the casting. Like, think how good the casting for that movie was. Like, Chris uh, uh, Chris Pratt. Um, yeah. Dave Kate Bautista Joyce was an unknown. Dave Bautista, like, what a great choice. And Vin and Diesel I, for Groot. For Groot. Bradley Cooper. Like, uh, wh- why? But it worked. For whatever yeah. reason, it fucking worked. And, like, there's a, the, the sequence where they escape from prison is fucking great. Like, that's really fun to watch, you know? Um, yeah. And, like, again, people, like, you watch, like, a movie like Super that James Gunn made on his own, and then you watch, like, Guardians of the Galaxy, and you can see the DNA of, like, the quote-unquote, like, indie, younger James Gunn in that movie just kind of watered down 
for general audiences for obvious reasons. And I'm, and then you like I'd almost argue think, more aged and matured, but sure. Well, I'm thinking watered down is in like you water down like a very strong drink for somebody who's not used to drinking. I mean, That's yeah, but I, also like Gun was. I think the age difference between those two movies is worth noting too. Of Gun like maturing as an individual and like changing his style. That's also very fair. I mean, like you have to in a way adopt like the Marvel style when you're one of those directors. But arguably, he did it the best. Other than like uh, one of my favorite Marvel movies is still Thor Ragnarok. Yeah. Like I love that. I love that movie. I think like yeah, I... the introduction of Valkyrie is fucking great. I've almost never seen a woman in a popular movie introduced that way where she's literally from the get go. A, a, an alcohol in a movie that children watched. She she's like a a defined alcoholic and that to me is really funny. You mentioned the like Marvel style and I think <laughs> Guardians yeah. of the Galaxy, Thor Ragnarok and Ant-Man and the Wasp are prime examples of yes Marvel has a style but you can still, like, kind of like coloring inside the lines. Yeah, there's lines, but what you color in them is up to you. You can. I mean, like, I would, I still, I, I have not seen either Ant-Man or Ant-Man and the Wasp. I would have loved, loved to see an Ant-Man movie directed entirely by Edgar Wright. I'm really upset that they didn't let him continue. That's like, yeah. With that project. Like, that is a, to me, I understand that that would be a risk. They would probably lose on like um, certain audiences, but I think he almost kind of. And granted, this movie came out after, I think, but he kind of proved that he could make a movie for general audiences who weren't familiar with him as a director when he made Baby Driver. Yeah. I've heard like parents talk about Baby Driver. Yeah. And it's like, holy shit, you're talking about an Edgar Wright movie. And he's not like this underground indie director, but he's a guy that like you don't expect many people above the age of like 32 to talk about. <laughs> You know, and and like, I feel like if they had just let him do his thing with a little bit of guidance and nudging from Marvel executives, they could have really made something like really interesting. So that to me is like a big disappointment and a lost opportunity. Yeah, but that's one of those things too, though. That, we don't, we'll never really know what happened behind the scenes. That's also the thing. He could have totally fucked it up. Like, it, it, they could have literally been like, Ed, like, Ed, this movie isn't good. Like, you're not. I, this, we're, <laughs> we, thought, we thought it would be okay, but you clearly don't mesh. That's fine. There's differences. So we're just going to let you go. We'll let somebody else come in. Well, and I almost wonder, like, because, again, I don't know hardly anything about Edgar Wright besides the fact that he dropped out of Ant-Man 1 and that Baby Driver was awesome. But, like, if Billy he Scott was... Pilgrim. Oh, yeah, he did do Scott Pilgrim. You have got to see... We're not getting Hot on that topic. Um, either Hot Buzz or Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> Didn't we talk about Scott Pilgrim last week? Yeah, we did. Oh, damn, uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the world ruined a whole generation of women. Is yep. what I've heard. <laughs> That's what I've heard from <laughs> from reputable sources. Yeah, I've just heard it somewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, he seems like one of those people who has to have things exactly his way. And so even a little bit of direction from the studio was, nope, I'm gone. I'm out. Peace. Yeah. I mean, I feel about it in the same way that I feel about, like, uh, Disney shit canning um, uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller uh, for Solo. Oh. Um, I mean, I could see, like, for obvious reasons, them making it too goofy. Because these are the same two guys who made, it, like, you know, Clone High and 21 Jump Street. So I could see them, like, leaning too much into a comedic vent or vein for solo mm -hmm. but it's like i'd love to see the solo movie they made i feel like it would have been like we need like a good star wars comedy movie we need like i think that universe has like the potential for it and i feel like it was robbed of that at least attempt by them like firing those two my god did you guys see the trailer for the star wars like what is it the anime stuff that I they're doing this fall parts of that Oh, oh my god, it looks amazing. I can't wait. It's gonna be amazing. Do you think it'll be better than the uh uh Tchaikovsky stuff from uh, the early in a different way. In a different oh. way because right. they they went and just went to like ten like there's there's some American animation studios, I'm pretty sure, but they went to like five or six like world famous japanese animation studios like i think trigger is doing one 
No fucking way. And didn't they like really? show up and basically be like, hey, it's Star Wars, but tell a story. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> they they showed up to them and they're like, all right, here's Star Wars. And they're like, okay, what are we going to make? And they're like, I don't know, figure it out. Get and they like, yeah. So hey, it's, oh, oh it's, it's going to be it's like awesome. Their, it's like their Halo Legends, basically. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I just looked it up. Trigger did two of them. No, fuck. and then uh, production IG did one. Oh, what? Oh, no. What is it's, IG it's gonna... done? Uh, yeah, I know. I can. I, I can't. Uh, Guilty Crown Psychopaths, Ghost oh, in the Shell. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Ghost in the Shell. What a great fucking film. Uh, I feel like we've gone pretty long here today. Yeah, RJ. We're, uh, I, uh, I was about to say three I'd... minutes over. On uh, our our hour point, and we haven't done any <laughs> advice. But oh well, that means Let's I have, don't one. have to look up questions hey, for R- next week. So there you well, go. RJ, just pick one piece of advice because you can edit some of this out. Pick one piece right. of advice. That you- but that means RJ has to do editing. Yeah, or no, Kyle well, does. I mean, yeah, we'll blame I mean, we'll make Kyle do it. Um, I'm going to choose up Kyle in a long time. Hey, well, Kyle's Kyle's been sitting in the, he's just been sitting in a chair behind me for the last few months. He just sits and waits. <laughs> cute he just sits and waits and if he moves uh he knows what happens next um i'm gonna go with this question men when do you introduce the person you are dating to your friends with the further details do you have a set amount of dates or does it vary oh i feel like it would vary based on the person if you i mean you don't also your friends like i feel like some friends you'd be like the instant you start seeing someone be like yeah i'm about to go see someone other friends it's just like eh, we're not that close so if this becomes serious i'll let them know yeah i would say like at for me i would say probably like after a couple months if i'm dating somebody but i i also agree with cal word is like very contextual and on a case-by-case basis because there's like the quote unquote dream or like ideal scenario where it's like you meet this person and you you both for whatever reason are just like, yeah, like you're the person I'm going to be with. And in that case, like I would feel comfortable introducing them if that was such the connection. I would feel comfortable introducing them after like a week or two to uh, friends and stuff, because I think it'd be fun just to hang out with them in a scenario with like you guys or other people I know. But here's yeah. my uh, here's my decree. Five, five date, five dates. That's a, that's a uh, lot. Five, that, five that's date. a lot. I will. I'm five, willing to bargain it down three to five. Okay, I think I think a five date rule is a good is a good measure. Because I think that's based good. on based on my limited experience. Um, three dates was not enough the first time. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to bump it up to five. I well, would. I would. I would agree with i think five is a good like solid number i would say um because within that time like that's a lot of different dates that's a lot of opportunities to get to know somebody and like the hope would be somewhere within that time frame you either realize that it's not going to work or you do realize that it's going to work and either way the structure falls apart at some point exactly yes so there's an advice piece for you to end on so that we still technically are an advice podcast hell yeah um yeah thank you both for the fuck you say i said that's the dream thank you rj you're not the dream so so harsh rj you are the dream james (laughs) oh you're a dream too calvin it's heartwarming (laughs) i mean i don't know if i'll remember the dream when i wake up but you're there and we appreciate you for it also the goal uh, thank you to the band Problem of Interest for letting us use the song Living in the Moment off the album Cross Off yesterday. You can find them on iTunes and Spotify, just like you can find us on iTunes and Spotify. Also on Google Podcasts and wherever good podcasts are found. Give us a like, download, review, etc. Share with your friends. Tell your friends to listen to us. If they don't listen, who will? And make make them suffer along with you. You've been here for an hour. Make them be here for an hour. Uh, if you also want to get more of us, we're on Facebook. Better Buddies. We have Meme Mondays, and we share our questions so that you can answer them before the week, before you hear our answers at the end of the week. You can find us on Twitter, at BetterBudcast. Use the hashtag BetterBuddies when you tweet about the show. 
And last but not least, our Gmail, betterbuddiescast at gmail.com. Send us fan art, hate art, fan mail, hate mail, declarations of love, and or war. Last but not least, be a better buddy. The one that I for me is one i wrote and then yeah uh, i can tell it, it it's very much you in it yeah i know i we, love uh, it start the episode yes sir favorite smash character is rob wow yeah. i, I see how it is james i love rob oh I'm, i want to schedule a meeting with james kukon well go for it uh, we're gonna we're gonna start the episode but james you're on thin ice you mess up once I mean, your favorite Uh-oh. Smash character is Rob. Good grief. Are you, are you serious? What? Do you think he's annoying or you just don't like him? Pichu for life, my dude. Pichu? <laughs> yeah. That's fair. I, I'm not going to I'm not gonna disagree with that, but I, I love Rob. Rob's, Rob's a great middleweight. All right. Three, two, one.